Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. So we've already talked a little bit about adulteration and swindling, um, and this week I thought it would be fun to talk about laws. So there were a lot of different kind of edicts and laws that came about as a result of the amount of corruption and swindling that was kind of persistent throughout history in the wine trade. Um, an interesting thing to note is that as a historian, um, we actually look at laws in effort to see what was actually happening. So let's say that nobody was necessarily writing down, hey, I'm putting iron filings in my, you know, wine that I'm, you know, trading to people and charging them a lot of money. Um, somebody would absolutely be writing down a law that would kind of explain that something was happening, like somebody was putting iron filings or somebody was putting um, too much salt water or something into um, wine. So that's a good way that we can kind of inside out look at what was happening um, throughout history because a lot of things weren't written down but laws were. So let's get started on some laws. Um, first we have a law from the 5th century BC. Um, it's from a place called Thassos and this law is really interesting because it lets us know about a little something that was happening. The law states that if you're if you're buying wine it, and it's in one of those big jars called pithoi, um, it, the jar has to be sealed. It has to have the original seal on it. It must be sealed. You may not buy um, a jar with an open seal, kind of like a Snapple cap today. If the Snapple cap is popped, it's a no-go. Put it back. Um, it's similar to that. But also an interesting thing was that you couldn't even buy portions of it. So you couldn't buy like a little jar full or a ladle full of something from a pithoi. It had to be a full jar that you got and it had to be sealed directly from, um, the producer. So this lets us know that there was a lot of, you know, mid-trade things happening where people were probably trying to water down or trying to do things because another part of the law was that you couldn't buy already watered down um, wine. So watered down wine was very, very common, um, but it had to be done afterwards by you, the consumer, as opposed to by the merchant um, or even by the producer. So this lets us know that there was a lot of distrust, um, and distrust generally happens for a reason. Um, so there's that one. Um, no small quantities, no open jars, no watered down. Another interesting one that happens a little bit later on was that the consumer at a tavern, for instance, needed to be able to visually see and have eyes on the wine cask being opened, the kind of ladle being put in, and their um, drink being poured. And if you didn't have eyes on every step of that, the barkeep person could be thrown in jail and the tavern owner could be fined because it was just so common that people would be swindled and they were paying fine money for this and wine was not necessarily always cheap um, and people were just being swindled too much. So you actually had to have eyes. It had to be able to see. It had to be right out in the store of how your wine was being taken from the cask to your cup or your jug, um, which is quite strict, isn't it? But probably a good idea. Um, then next we have one, uh, which is kind of about the pricing. So I have a little quote here, um, and it's about the assize courts. So these were courts that generally tried to make fix the prices of things, and they based that on how common something was. Like if there was kind of a scarcity of a certain product, it would be more expensive to make sure that, you know, people weren't being sold out completely, and if something was very abundant, it would have a lower price. So these courts kind of went through, and you actually weren't permitted um, to sell from your tavern unless the assize court had come in, set the price for your wine, they would have tasted it, they would have made sure that everything was fine um, and then they would have set the price for your wine um, and you could not sell it was illegal to sell without that so I just have a quote here the assayers were eight or twelve men chosen by the mayor and aldermen from the uh, from among those vintners of greatest experience and it was their duty to assay the wine in all the London taverns and have each ton marked at its value according to the current price fixed for its type the mark had to be at the front of the ton so that the buyer could see it, and each tavern 
customer had the right to see his own wine drawn. So here we have kind of like a compilation of everything. Um, and they're really making sure, first of all, these are people that know wine. These are kind of like vintners and, and professionals and experts, and they're tasting the wine to make sure that the wine that you say you have is indeed the wine you have. They're marking it visibly so that all the customers can see it, and the customer has to be able to see the wine coming out of this cask. So clearly there are so many steps being taken um, within this very paragraph. So it wasn't only really about sales that these um, laws were being created, it was also about quality. So interestingly enough, the quality definitely varied of different wines, like we talked about iron filings and things like that, and one of the most common things that got taken way too far um, was the addition of sodium chloride. And so people were salting wines because they thought that it made them um, seem more mature, seem, seem more complex. So this was taken to an extreme, to the fact that the government had to issue and test wines and issue a law that said that if your wine had more than one gram of sodium chloride per liter, that it was illegal to sell it. So clearly this kind of regulation of what's, of the additives that are being put into wine um, was very important and lets us know that this was a huge problem. How much salt, you know, realistically are you possibly putting in that it had to be a mandate from, you know, way up top that you could not put in more than this. Um, speaking of way up top and mandates, bureaucrats in Rome in the first century BC actually were involved so much in this corruption, the wine trade was incredibly lucrative, and they definitely had opportunities to take advantage of in corruption and kind of um, definitely use their office to their advantage. Um, and so this actually got so bad that there was a um, law passed, and it's called the Lex Cornelia de Rependuntis, and it actually harshened the penalties that these kind of people in the government had to withstand if they did engage in this corruption in the wine market because they clearly there was not enough of a deterrent in the first place so they actually had to make things even harder for them um, in order to kind of make them stop doing these things they all had lawyers and they had to go in court and everything was just not a good situation so seeing as they felt the government felt the need to actually pass this um the Senate actually passed this about the governors um, who were kind of causing these problems, you can tell that it's definitely a big problem um, in society in Rome in the first century. So I hope that you enjoyed learning about these different laws and you can see how learning about the laws tells us about the problems that were happening at the time and I will see you next week. Cheers!